Hello, AP Calculus AP students, Mr. Record here. We're going to take a look at our third video from Implicit Differentiation, that is topic 3.2. And this is uh, oftentimes it's an example that I may not cover with my students in the classroom. I sometimes suggest that they take a look at the video outside of the classroom to get a little bit of taste in terms of what I was trying to accomplish. But we're going to take the idea of a done conic section that may have been studied in a previous class and apply the idea of implicit differentiation to that conic section. So in our notes here, we've got uh, our topic 3.2, example 3, that begins with this equation, x squared plus 4y squared equal to 4. And in part A, all that we were supposed to do is sketch this graph um, on the coordinate plane provided. Now, as far as how to do that, a lot of it depends on what your prior background and training is in your Algebra 2 or pre-calculus class. It's possible that you may have had a robust experience and were exposed to the conic sections, the parabolas, the circles, the ellipses, and the hyperbolas. And you might be able to follow through the, the next few minutes of this video to rewrite this equation so that we can graph it. It's possible that maybe you don't cover those topics. It's possible at the time of this recording that you were uh, sort of victimized by a, an abbreviated uh, curriculum because of COVID-19 and the conic section uh, topics were not covered at all or very thoroughly. So what I want to do is, is I want to still show how I would have approached this with a bunch of students who know a little bit about conic sections, but I don't want that to be the focus of the video. The focus of this video is really about how to take this derivative implicitly. And hopefully we know that this is an implicitly written equation. So the quickest way to graph this, well, the quickest way is to understand that this has the potential to be a conic section. And if we were to divide everything through by a four, we could end up with a form that would look like this. Now you might ask, well, why do we even bother to divide by four? Well, that's what conic sections are all about. When you, we have them written in standard form, we know that there would be a one over on the right side. And then from that point, we should be able to recognize which conic section this represents. And lo and behold, we have our good friend, the ellipse here. We have an ellipse because both X and Y are squared, which is probably going to just eliminate the idea that this could be a parabola. We see that there is a plus sign in between the two. Well, that, that eliminates the idea that this could be a hyperbola. And then we see that the coefficients of the x squared and the y squared terms are indeed different. One is 1 fourth, one is 1. And that would eliminate the idea of the circle leaving only with the ellipse. And then if you recall, the center of the ellipse is found by looking at what other values you have within the x and the y squared portions. Notice x is not being added nor subtracted to, uh, from anything. Y is not being added or subtracted to anything. So 0, 0 would serve as the center. And then the idea is that you would just simply take the square root of the denominator of the x squared which is 2, and that's how far you would count out in the x direction. You would do the same thing, take the square root of the denominator of the y squared, which is 1, and that's how far you count out in the y directions. And if we connect these dots ever so carefully, we would have this shape that we have grown to love as the ellipse. It's not an oval. It's, it would be called an ellipse. Now it says over here in my TI Inspire tip, uh, for those of you that use the TI Inspire, you can graph this three different ways. Now, if you don't own a TI Inspire, don't worry about it. You still might enjoy this little portion of the video, but there are three different methods by which you can graph these kinds of functions. And each one has kind of evolved over time. Like method two used to be the old method when the original TI Inspire came out. And then we had the ability to do things like method one and method three. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to bring up my TI Inspire software and we're going to graph this using, let's say, method one. All right, and here we go. We're going to take a look at our TI Inspire. I'm going to pull up a document here. I don't have to work in a document. I could work on a scratch pad, but I certainly want to bring up a graphing page. Now, if you bring up a graphing page, by default, it's going to ask that you enter your uh, equation in as a function and we know darn well that this is not a function so we're going to go into the menu graph entry option and choose relation now 
while we're here, just so you know, the other option, uh, one of the other three options, or one of the other two options, would be to go to Equation Templates, and you can actually choose the template of the ellipse. Of course, that means that you would have to know that this was an ellipse ahead of time. But in the Relation option, we wouldn't necessarily have to know that, because from here, we can just simply type in the equation as we see it off the page, which, whoops, we'll go with the original equation. There is no fraction to begin with, sorry. So x squared plus 4y squared equaling 4 will give us that wonderful ellipse that we just happened to sketch for a moment ago. All right, we'll return to this calculator in just a moment um, as we uh, finish the rest of the problem. So let's go back to the document. So here we are back at the document, going on to part B, where we're asked to find the derivative of y with respect to x for the equation above. So what we're going to do is use our idea of implicit differentiation. As we come, uh, come across from left to right, if we encounter an x, like the x squared up here, we will take his derivative normally and, of course, get 2 times x. But then when we come to the 4y squared, as you can see up here, that derivative would be 8 times y but we need to tack on the dy dx that is so required as part of that implicit differentiation technique. And then the derivative of 4 is going to be 0. And at this point, solving for dy dx doesn't seem like it's going to be too terribly difficult because we would do a couple of different things. We would first of all subtract the 2x over to the right side, and then we would divide by the 8 times y. And if you choose to do so, you could go ahead and reduce this by factoring out and, and canceling with a 2. And so we would have negative x over 4 times y. And it's perfectly acceptable to present that derivative in the form of x and y. Let's keep moving on with this question and see what else is being asked. In part C, they ask us, to find the slope of the tangent line to this curve at that point, square root of 2, negative 1 over square root of 2. Not a very pretty point, but we must trust in the fact that that point does lie on the curve. And so all we need to do here is say, well, we're going to take this derivative dy over dx, and we're going to evaluate it such that the point is this. And I like this notation because it's pretty clear that we're going to plug something in for x, something in for y. Uh, a lot of students don't use this notation. I suppose if you just immediately rewrote this expression, plugged in the x and the y, you would be still answering the, the problem, but maybe not communicating it as well as you could. So I do really like to see this notation. So the, the uh, numerator would be negative, and the x is replaced by square root of 2. And then for the denominator, we've got 4 multiplied by y, which is going to be replaced by negative over 1 over square root of 2. And if we work on this a little bit, the numerator is going to still be negative square root of 2. Looks like the denominator would be negative 4 over the square root of 2. And I think we could probably simplify this just a little bit by multiplying by the reciprocal of the denominator. And that would give us something like this. Hopefully you see that the negative signs will cancel. Once the square root of 2's are multiplied together, you would get 2, and then 2 fourths is going to reduce to 1 half. And that would be the slope of the tangent line. Something that might be worth investigating here, if I go back up to the graph, finding the point square root of 2, negative 1 over square root of 2, may not be the easiest thing in the world. If we know a little bit about the fact that the square root of 2 is approximately 1.4, it's something that I try to have my students kind of ingrain in their minds throughout the year. Sometimes it's a little tough to, to always remember that. But that can help a bit because you know that 1.4 is right about here. And then since negative 1 over square root of 2 is the other uh, coordinate, we know that that must be the y that, that goes downward since it's negative, and negative 1 over the square root of 2 might be very tough to approximate, but if we were to rationalize the denominator, I believe we get negative square root of 2 over 2. Think about that negative 
uh, square root of 2 as being approximately negative 1.4. So if you cut negative 1.4 in half, you get about negative 0.7. And that looks pretty good. That looks to be about that location. Well, the reason why I wanted to show this to you is if I had the ability to just uh, sketch a, a tangent line that I could draw maybe by hand, it's possible that it could look like this. Again, I'm just sketching it by hand. It's kind of tough to do. But I think it's reasonable to say that this slope might be 1 over 2, up 1 over 2. At least we know it's in the ballpark. All right, let's keep going with this part D. D is not going to require a whole heck of a lot of extra work because you've done most of it already. Write the equation of the tangent line drawn to the curve at this particular point. So we break out our good friend, the point-slope formula. We know it sets up like y minus the y value which would look something like that, and that would equal the slope times the quantity x minus the x value. And quite honestly, I like that answer. I really would prefer that we don't try to get y by itself because that could lead to a lot of errors and we don't want that to happen. So I'm gonna stay right there with that particular result. Now for part E, the final part. It says, let's write the equation above explicitly and then use the TI Inspire graphing calculator to verify your graph from part A. And then it says you can take that derivative explicitly and then compare it. So let's give that a try. So I'm going to rewrite the original equation. It's been a while. We may have forgotten it, but it's x squared plus 4y squared equal 4, I believe. And then if we write this explicitly, that means we're going to solve it for y. I believe we can solve this one for y. So we're going to subtract the x squared over. We're going to divide by y. A couple of different ways that you can do this. Um, how about we just divide or divide by 4, I'm sorry. And I'm going to rewrite it like this. I'm not going to break it apart just yet or cancel it. But I am going to go ahead and take the square root of both sides, which would give me something that looks like this, let's say. And I would have to put a plus or minus. That's very, very important. That plus or minus is extremely important when you are solving this explicitly. Now it says to use your TI Inspire graph and calculator to verify that our graph from part A and our graph from this part E will corroborate. So I want you to take a good look at what that y equal looks like because I'm about ready to type that in to the TI Inspire. So here we are back with the TI Inspire graphing calculator. I am going to go ahead and pull up my graph entry line so that I can say now I would like to use a function. Now we have a bit of a problem here because our function has a plus or minus in front of it, which really means that it is not a function. If we were to separate this and think of it as two separate functions, one with the plus and one with the minus, then I think I can get by with calling them each a function. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to first of all enter this positive version of that result. So I'm going to uh, put down my uh, square root template along with my um, fraction and I'll proceed to type in 4 minus x squared over 4. And that would be ooh, the top half. And then what I'm going to do with this so that I can get a little bit of a distinction between the colors, I'm going to choose this to be a different color. So I can go into my menu and uh, choose, uh, let's see, the quickest way for me to do that probably is to right click or control menu. And I'm going to change this color to, how about this red? So you can see when I highlight this function in red, it shows up very nicely. All right, next thing as I'm going to do is go back into my graph entry. It's still going to be a function. And now for F2, I want to type in the opposite. Now, I could just type in F1 of X if I so chose because it's already entered, but it won't take a, a just a couple of seconds to get my square root and to get my fraction template all put together. And then this graph is probably going to be in red as well. And that's perfectly fine because I can see that when I highlight him, I have now focused on the bottom part of the function and that pretty much or the bottom part of the ellipse and, and that makes sense because we have a positive for the top half a negative for the a bottom half and students that might be using say ti-84 calculators especially the older ones might have to graph their conic sections the ellipses in this case using two different functions uh, in order to graph both the top and the bottom
Let's go ahead and return back to the document to finish up the problem. So here we go for the finale of this particular problem. And we're basically here on this last line that says, take this derivative explicitly and let's compare it to the result with part B. I'm not gonna worry so much about what we have for part B. Let's find out what this derivative of Y is. So we'll say that dy dx is, and I notice that we start off with this plus minus. And I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. Let's just take that plus minus and we'll drop it in. We'll kind of like throw it down and, and, and kind of work through it and maybe refer back to what kind of role it's going to play. Now, I also want to make this problem as easy as possible. In other words, before I take this derivative, I noticed that this square root of 4 in the denominator could factor out to the front as a 1 over 2. And then I just simply have uh, 4 minus x squared to the positive 1 half power. That's before I even consider taking a derivative. I think I've got it in a pretty good state right now. So if I take this 1 half out in front, multiply it by the 1 half that's there, I have a fourth. And then I have, of course, 4 minus x squared all raised to the negative half. But don't forget the chain rule, which means we have to multiply by the derivative of what's inside, negative 2x. This thing could probably be simplified just a little bit. One of the things that I notice, this negative sign, it's kind of interesting. This negative sign, we could think of it a couple of different ways. Well, it could come out and perhaps be absorbed by the plus or minus. Um, that's one way. Um, let's maybe think of it like this. Let's keep this plus or minus there. Maybe bring out the negative. And then the 2 over the 4 would, of course, be a 1 half like that. And then if we've got the x that's going to be in the numerator. And then this 4 minus x squared can come down to the denominator and act as such. We can have it written over a square or under a square root, let's say. Now, we're supposed to compare this with our result from part B. So what was our result from part B? Well, it was pretty simple. It was just negative x over 4y. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to rewrite that here from part B we had dy dx equivalent to negative 4, or I'm sorry, negative x over 4 times y. Now, do these look the same? Well, on the surface, they certainly don't seem to look the same. So we might want to think about ways that we can get them to be similar. And there's so many different ways that you could make this happen. Uh, one way is we could acknowledge that this y in this problem here was defined to be what I have over here, right? And so if I replaced him with this information, plus or minus the square root of 4 minus x squared all over 4, we could examine this a little bit more closely and probably tell that some simplification can happen. I'm going to move this way since I'm running out of room. But the square root of 4 is going to be a 2, if you recall. So I could cancel those just a little bit, have a 2 there. And then I have my square root 4 minus x squared still in the denominator. But I haven't taken care of this plus or minus yet. And so maybe I could just bring that out to the front, if you will. And then boom, hopefully immediately you see that these two things are indeed the same. I could have also worked the other direction and rewrote the way that square root of 4 minus x squared appears by perhaps solving it right here for uh, itself and writing it in terms of y and we could see that we have the same relationship going the other way. But the point of the video is to show you that implicit differentiation does back up the results that you get from differentiating explicitly um, as well. You're probably not going to do both of them simultaneously from this point on. You're probably going to only do implicit differentiation when a problem calls for it and that's when it's written as a pretty nasty relation where x and y are all mixed together and y can't be solved for. We've got a few more videos for implicit differentiation that we want you to check out, so be sure to do so. In the meantime, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.